Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. On October 12, 1773, the first insane asylum in the United States opened its doors. Located in Williamsburg, Virginia, the public hospital, by its own admission, was established for the support and maintenance of idiots, lunatics, and other persons of unsound minds who threatened society. Realistically, there was little support for these unfortunates. Before the establishment of the hospital, insane individuals were actually judged by a jury, not a doctor, and classified as a criminal, a lunatic, or an idiot. They were regarded as collateral damage in the quest for colonial normalcy. Almost two and a half centuries later, their anguish can still be felt in the walls of the later-named Eastern State Hospital. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness, weirdo family member Krista Lee shares a personal encounter with a spirit in her bathroom. Belief in witches, hexes, and powerful spirits was prevalent in the 19th century and into the 20th century. In fact, in rural areas of Pennsylvania, it might still be practiced today, so it's the perfect setting for a murder involving curses and a local witch. Parking tickets, floppy disks, and escaped victims – these helped catch a handful of serial murderers who would likely have never been caught otherwise. It's been called a freak of nature, as weird as it is beautiful. Seen here are terrifying flying entities, giant skeletons, and even the legendary Bigfoot. We'll look at the mysterious, strange, and dangerous Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. But first, Eastern State Hospital was originally known as the Public Hospital for Persons of Insane and Disordered Minds, built in 1773. It was America's first mental asylum, and the horrors in the minds of its patients couldn't compare to the horrors of the asylum itself. While you're listening, you might want to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com, you can find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, 24-7 streaming video of horror hosts and classic horror movies, shop the Weird Darkness store for weirdo merchandise. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Abandoned asylums, haunted hospitals, and ghost-infested sanatoriums are some of the spookiest places to get your urban exploring fix. A plethora of haunted places are open for visitation all over the world, including the very first insane asylum in the United States, Eastern State Hospital, located in Williamsburg, Virginia. First built in 1773, the hospital was originally known as the Public Hospital for Persons of Insane and Disordered Minds. It only featured 24 rooms total, many of which remained unfilled for a number of years. The facility also suffered numerous fires and was even occupied for a time during the Civil War. Unfortunately, as is the case with many centuries-old institutions, this hospital wasn't entirely concerned with healing its patients. Instead, it focused on keeping them jailed and sequestering them from normal members of society. The history of Eastern State Hospital, 
while conducive to spooky tales and ghost stories, is also a blot on the nation's record of mental health treatment, rife with human rights violations and tragic testimonials of mistreatment. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the hospital was created not necessarily to help the unstable, but rather to protect everyone else from those whom doctors considered mentally deranged. During the 18th and 19th centuries, sanity was determined through legal trials rather than professional medical observation. In the mid-1700s, Francis Fouquier, the governor of Virginia, proposed a hospital meant to house a poor, unhappy set of people who are deprived of their senses and wander about the country, terrifying the rest of their fellow creatures. In 1773, the same year as the Boston Tea Party, the Public Hospital for Persons of Insane and Disordered Minds first opened its doors, admitting America's first mental patient. The hospital was hardly comparable to the clinical centers of today and was more akin to a prison. The facility contained 24 cells, each with barred windows and reinforced doors. Inside these cells were straw-filled mattresses, chamber pots, and iron shackles attached to the walls. Among the many morbid devices on display at the museum which now stands in the hospital's former facility, none are quite as gruesome as the tranquilizer chair. Dr. Benjamin Rush, who incorrectly believed mental imbalances were caused by brain inflammation, created the chair under the notion that fear was the best means to induce sanity. According to Dr. Rush, terror acts powerfully upon the body through the medium of the mind and should be employed in the cure of madness. Rush designed the chair to not only retain the patient, but to deprive them of sight and slow the blood flow to their brains. A bucket was also placed beneath the seat. Subjects were injected with laxatives believed to release any bodily impurities. Hospital patients were forced to wear straitjackets, remain chained and confined in solitude, and even lay in coffin-like Utica cribs stacked on top of one another. In 1799, two dungeon-like cells were constructed beneath the first floor of the hospital for those prone to raving frenzy. Prevailing 18th-century beliefs claimed that mental instability was a chosen state. Restraints, electric shocks, or bleedings were perceived cures for unsound minds. Not only were straitjackets and manacles employed to keep patients in order, but iron chains attached near their bedsides were frequently used as well. Substances were also administered to evacuate patients' digestive tracts, and devices such as lancers and scarificators were used to bleed out harmful fluids. Patients were plunged into ice-cold water in an attempt to jar them from their mental states. Many medical professionals believed fear was the key element in these cures, leading inhumane doctors to torment their own patients for decades. When the institution was first built, its grounds featured a large yard where patients could enjoy the sun and fresh air. But this yard was torn down shortly after for the staff's convenience. Not until 1790 were two new yards made, one on each side of the hospital. These new, significantly smaller areas featured enormous fences that were 10 feet high and 80 feet long. No furniture or other such perceived luxuries were provided for the patients. Restriction was still the primary method of care. These outdoor areas were dubbed the mad yards and are heavily reminiscent of modern-day prison yards. The hospital frequently used unmarked graves to dispose of patients when they passed, a common practice among many hospitals at the time. The Eastern State Hospital does, however, maintain a reminder of the patients and their struggles. Four granite slabs have patients' names etched into them, while a fifth simply holds a memorial reading, We erect this monument in memory of those persons whom we have known, loved, and served through the years. While living, they knew the suffering of inner pain, confusion, and despair. Now they are at peace in the hands of God, where no torment will ever touch them again. The hospital's conditions and treatments were undoubtedly atrocious, but they were not always so. In 1841, Dr. John Minson Galt was elected superintendent, 
and he believed in far more humane treatments. Over the course of 21 years, Galt took steps to reduce the appalling treatments employed by the hospital and replaced them with a method he called moral management therapy. This method was very successful, so much so that restraints were barely used and the patients were much happier and granted much more freedom. They were even able to visit the nearby town on field trips and outings. His methods were unpopular with the hospital's directors, however, and they fought him at every turn. In 1862, the Civil War swept through Williamsburg, and Union soldiers took control of the hospital. With Galt unable to help any of his patients, he fell into a deep depression and eventually took his own life. Some claim his ghost still walks the halls of the reconstructed hospital, seeking out the patients formerly under his care. In the institution's early days, a patient escaped the hospital and fled to the nearby palace of Virginia's governor. He apparently intended to slay the governor in the palace's hedge maze, but was foiled before he could carry out the deed. Those who visit the palace grounds claim the patient still roams in search of targets. In 2003, a group of students from the College of William and Mary fulfilled an infamous school tradition when they climbed over the palace wall and ventured into the hedge maze. Inside, the group witnessed a pair of ghostly white feet that crept closer when illuminated with their flashlight beam. The students soon fled in terror. The hospital's first fire occurred in 1876 and wiped out the chapel, kitchen, and storage areas, among other rooms. In 1885, two patients may have perished in the hospital's largest fire. Tragically, the closest volunteer fire department at the time was 50 miles away, so there was nothing to do but watch the building crumble. By the time the fire was extinguished, it had taken down five more buildings. The last fire occurred in 1902 and wiped out a single building that was originally erected in 1844. All of the buildings were eventually replaced, although with much more space between them, likely to prevent future fires from spreading. When the hospital first opened in 1773, it was called the Public Hospital for Persons of Insane and Disordered Minds. In the 1840s, under the guidance of Dr. Galt, it was renamed the Eastern Lunatic Asylum. Although a significant portion of the grounds burned in 1885, they were soon rebuilt and continued to operate for several more decades. Following this reconstruction, the facility was given its current title, the Eastern State Hospital, not to be confused with the dozen other hospitals of the same name across the U.S. In the 1930s, the hospital moved to a new location, though the original buildings were preserved for historical reasons. The old grounds were reopened as a museum, featuring numerous exhibits of the hospital's old devices and treatments. Even the cells were recreated in the most minute detail. Up next, weirdo family member Krista Lee shares a personal encounter with a spirit in her bathroom, and we'll look at how five different serial killers were finally caught through unexpected means. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help 
help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. I was in my freshman year of high school when I had my first official encounter with a ghost. My dad called me into the kitchen to talk to me, and when he was done, he flipped a spoonful of whipped cream in my face. He'd been using the cream for a pie and thought it'd be funny to throw some at one of us kids. I went to the bathroom to clean up. I was bent over the sink when I felt a cool hand on my shoulder. Thinking it was my mom, I glanced in the mirror only to see the face of my recently deceased great-grandmother. She smiled at me and said, I love you, baby girl. Then she vanished. I've always believed in the supernatural and paranormal, but this visit helped to confirm their existence for me. Serial killers often pride themselves on being untouchable. That confidence can sometimes help them charm their way into their victims' lives or allow them to lead double lives, tricking their families into believing they are someone else. But it also leads to their downfall. Here are five stories of serial killers who, along with a little luck, were the cause of their capture. Jeffrey Dahmer, known as the Milwaukee Cannibal, got away with molesting, murdering, dismembering, and eating 17 victims between 1978 and 1991. By 1988, he'd already spent 10 months in jail for fondling a 13-year-old boy and then offering him $50 to pose for pictures in the nude. He was let out early and put on probation, but his caseworker never made the required stops by his apartment. At one point during his 13-year murder spree, Dahmer was also approached by police over a young Asian teen who was found on a curb, naked and bloody. Dahmer told the police that the boy was his partner, and so three officers who were eventually investigated turned their heads and declined to investigate further, leading to the young boy's death. All of that makes how Dahmer got caught so darkly ironic. When Dahmer was arrested, it was thanks to someone he had caught. Dahmer drugged and attempted to murder 32-year-old Tracy Edwards in July of 1991. Edwards got out and, after running away, was found by two officers in Dahmer's neighborhood, almost completely naked with a pair of handcuffs dangling from one of his wrists. When officers questioned him, Edwards told them that a freak had drugged and handcuffed him. The police brought Edwards back to Dahmer's apartment to investigate. Upon their arrival, Dahmer offered police the keys to the handcuffs. When Edwards told them that Dahmer attempted to use a knife on him in his bedroom, an officer entered the room to corroborate his account. There, he found photographs of the bodies Dahmer had dismembered. Dahmer was arrested by the police and further searching of his apartment revealed body parts, skulls, and jars of dismembered genitalia stored in a fridge, freezer, a filing cabinet, and a kettle. A parking ticket helped put the son of Sam behind bars. This infamous killer was arrested in Manhattan right before he planned to go down in a blaze of glory. Known for shooting 14 people, six of whom were killed, in New York City between 1976 and 1977, David Berkowitz was a member of the U.S. Army who served in South Korea as an excellent marksman. After returning to his hometown in 1974 following his service term, he took a position as a U.S. postal worker before turning his combat skills into a method of terror. After attacking and murdering his victims, he'd leave a note near the crime scene taunting authorities. Ironically, it would be a different kind of crime scene note that took down the man who called himself the Son of Sam. The first step towards arresting Berkowitz was a result of him regularly harassing his neighbors. Several of the other residents in his Yonkers apartment building claimed that they were left anonymous 
sometimes antagonistic notes. One reported that their dog had been shot with the same gun used by the son of Sam while another alleged a fire was started near his apartment. This put the police on to Berkowitz's behavior and kept him under their watchful eye. What ultimately nailed the son of Sam, though, was a tip from a 49-year-old woman who had a brief but unnerving encounter with Berkowitz right before he murdered two people. While walking her dog at 2.30 a.m., Cecilia Davis passed a man who looked her right in the face but held his right arm down stiffly. Minutes later, she heard shots and a car horn. She also happened to see an officer ticketing a cream-colored van a block from the site of Berkowitz's latest and final murder. After Davis came forward with her details, police checked their tickets for that night and were able to find a citation for Berkowitz's car, which he used for getaways from each murder, but didn't bother to change his plates for. The authorities caught Berkowitz leaving his apartment. As they caught up to him, Berkowitz turned to an inspector and said, I guess this is the end of the trail. Ted Bundy, known for raping and murdering 36 women in three states, was captured twice while driving. The first instance was for a traffic violation, in which he took a Utah Highway Patrol officer on a chase after he was caught driving his Volkswagen in a West Valley neighborhood without his headlights on. As Officer Bob Hayward questioned Bundy, he noticed weird things. The man was wearing all black a collection of gas receipts, a missing passenger seat, and a pair of shiny shoes that escaped kidnapping victim Carol DeRanche had reported were worn by her captor. When the officer asked Bundy where he'd been, the killer told him at a local drive-in watching Towering Inferno. Unfortunately for Bundy, Hayward knew that was a lie. He had been at the drive-in all night. Hayward called for backup, and he and two other officers searched the car uncovering a collection of obscure items like rope, handcuffs, pantyhose, and a crowbar before bringing him in. Booked for avoiding arrest, Bundy was identified in a lineup by DeRanche, arrested for her kidnapping, and sentenced to 15 years of jail time. Hayward had also reached out to out-of-state police departments, aware of their own missing teen cases. Two years into his sentence, Bundy was linked to the murder of a Colorado woman, after requesting to act as his own representation, he escaped from a prison's library window while preparing for his case. He was captured eight days later, but would escape again through a hole he dug in the ceiling of his cell. Due to the reduced staff during holiday time, correctional officers didn't notice he was gone for well over 12 hours, letting him get a significant lead. With the help of his eventual wife, Carol Ann Boone, Bundy was able to travel to Florida where he attacked the Chi Omega sorority house at Florida State University, killing two college women and beating two others. Days later, he would kidnap and murder a 12-year-old Florida girl in a stolen FSU van, and only four days later, after that, stole a VW Bug. Fearing that authorities were closing in, Bundy traveled all the way to the Alabama state line before getting pulled over for driving in a stolen vehicle. That would be the end of Bundy's run, he was arrested, charged, and sentenced to death for the murders of the FSU students. Then there's the case of Dennis Rader, and he can blame poor file security for his eventual takedown. After years of going uncaught following the murder of 10 Kansas locals, including four out of five members of the Otero family, the Kansas serial killer whose modus operandi was bind, torture, kill, entered into a game of cat and mouse with authorities. After seemingly killing his last victim in 1991, the murderer fell off the radar until 2004 when an article in the Wichita Eagle suggested that the infamous killer may either be dead or in prison. That spurred Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, to send a letter to the newspaper claiming he was responsible for a 1986 unsolved murder. Over the next 12 months, he would send more letters and puzzles to local media outlets. In 2005, Raider took the first steps to sealing his demise. As he had for the past year, Raider sent a local Wichita TV station a message in the form of a package placed in the back of a truck. An employee found it and ended up tossing it, 
but after no response, Raider reached out to the station to see if they'd gotten it. The station notified the police who searched the area and found the cereal box Raider left filled with documents, many of which revealed planned murders. There was also a piece of paper addressed directly to authorities. Can I communicate with Floppy and not be traced to a computer? Raider asked. If the police were honest, they should tell him through a classified ad in the paper. So that's exactly what authorities, less than honestly, did. Two weeks later, a local Kansas broadcast station was sent a package containing a floppy disk. When they opened it, it merely included the message, this is a test. After checking the properties section of the file, authorities discovered that the last person to save the file was a man named Dennis. They also uncovered that it had been used at the Christ Lutheran Church and the Park City Library. Despite the effort Raider took to delete identifying information from the disk, his choice to use a library printer – his own was broken – did him in. The police googled the name and locations attached to the file, used DNA evidence from the Otero crime scene and one of Raider's relatives, and finally pinned Raider for some of the most infamous murders in America. And sometimes, serial killers are caught because they break their own rules. Like the son of Sam, Israel Keyes was a former soldier raised in a Mormon family who reveled in his fascination and obsession with serial murder. With an extensive knowledge of his predecessors, Keyes aimed to be unique and uncatchable, but eventually fell victim to what he thought separated him from the rest – a lack of control. Identified as a serial killer, rapist, arsonist, burglar, and bank robber, Keyes had a girlfriend and daughter despite having spent more than a decade raping, robbing, and killing victims around the country. Three deaths were tied directly to him, but anywhere between 8 and 12 are alleged. Keyes' success was due in part to his extensive planning, which includes burying murder kits, weapons, cash, and tools to clean up crime scenes, and an unwritten rule based on his research and knowledge of other captured serial killers. He would travel outside and go to great lengths to distance himself from any of his victims, Anchorage homicide detective Monique Dahl told ABC News. That was primarily derived from his obsession with not being like the other serial killers. He had researched and read other serial killers, Dahl told ABC. He knew a lot about Ted Bundy. He was very careful to say that he had not patterned himself after any other serial killers, that his ideas were his own. That necessity for distinction and control, all signatures of serial killers, got the best of him during his last murder, which was only supposed to be a robbery. With plans to take the register at the coffee shop, Keyes confessed that he thought about not killing his victim, a young female employee working alone if she didn't have a car. But upon seeing his victim, he was overcome, wrestling her to his vehicle before raping and strangling her there. It broke both parts of his proximity rule as he murdered in his car and in his hometown. He then did something even more sloppy. He used his victim's credit card at several ATMs in another state to take out money, allowing police to track him down. When Weird Darkness Returns, Belief in witches, hexes, and powerful spirits was prevalent in the 19th century and into the 20th century. In fact, in rural areas of Pennsylvania, it might still be practiced today. So it's the perfect setting for a murder involving curses and a local witch. He has been spotted all over the world, but photographic evidence is lacking, as is any scientific proof. But he still exists and is still seen. And now you can search for Bigfoot every month in the Find Bigfoot Calendar by Timothy Wayne Williams. Each month you'll be captivated by an original Timothy Wayne Williams painting, beautiful and captivating. 
but within each painting hides a monster. Bigfoot is hiding somewhere in each painting. Search for Bigfoot and invite others to do so as well with the new Find Bigfoot calendar available now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Bigfoot. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Bigfoot. Anyone who believes that we live in an age dominated by science and skepticism needs to study the history of Pennsylvania. In the rural areas of the state, a belief in witches, hexes, powerful spirits, and the like was common until well into the 20th century. For all I know, it still quietly exists today. Remote farm communities saw superstition and folklore not as quaint relics of a medieval past but as all too real presences in their lives. Sometimes these beliefs took the benign forms of good luck charms, folk medicine, and positive spirituality. At other times, however, believers found themselves haunted by sincerely held fears of curses and ghostly persecutions. On occasion, these fears led these tormented souls to defend themselves through acts of violence, even murder. Probably the most famous example is the case of Nelson Raymire. In 1928, a central Pennsylvania witch named Nellie Knoll convinced a young man named John Blymere that Raymire had put a curse on him. Blymere and two friends, John Curry and Wilbert Hess, broke into Raymire's home in order to steal a spell book they believed he owned. They were unable to find this book, but when Raymire accosted them, the trio gruesomely killed him. In the hope of lifting this curse. The three youths were eventually convicted of the murder. One of the many oddities of the case is that the killers had never before committed any criminal offense, and after their release from prison, went on to lead thoroughly normal, law-abiding lives. Although the following hex murder is now largely forgotten, it was very similar to the Raymire case, and in some respects even more bizarre. Our story opens in 1934, in the Pennsylvania farming village of Ringtown. Life there had only a speaking acquaintance with the 20th century. Scarcely any residents had electricity or modern plumbing, and telephones were non-existent. Among its residents was a 63-year-old widow named Susanna Susan Mummy. She lived in a primitive farmhouse in the hills just outside of town with her adopted daughter Tovilia. Back in 1910, Susan had had a premonition. A vision or dream told her that if on July 5th of that year her husband Henry went to his job at a local powder mill, he would die. Although she begged him to stay home on that day, he laughingly dismissed her fears and went to work as usual. You guessed it. On that very day, Henry was killed when a workplace accident caused a violent explosion. The tragic event earned Susan Mummy not sympathy, but fear. The deadly accuracy of her premonition caused her neighbors to think of her as a witch, and considering what had happened to Henry, possibly a dangerous one. From that time on, Ringtown regarded her with a mixture of awe and deep suspicion. On the evening of March 17th, Susan and Tavilia were living with a boarder named Jacob Rice and Rice was staying there because he had a serious foot injury that Mummy was doctoring. Like many so-called witches, Mummy had some proficiency in the healing arts. Before going to bed, Mummy went to change Rice's bandage. As she bent over his foot, the cottage seemed to suddenly explode. The inhabitants heard a frightening roar, and the living room window shattered. The wind coming through the broken glass extinguished their lamps, leaving the stunned trio in darkness. They heard a second blast, which they now recognized as the sound of a gun. Someone out in that black night was trying to kill them. They crouched on the floor, terrified by the thought of what might happen next. But there was only silence. After a few minutes had passed, Rice finally worked up the nerve to sit up. He could see nothing, 
and all he heard was the sound of Tavilia, whimpering in fear. He called out Susan's name but got no response. He managed to light a lamp, which illuminated Mrs. Mummy's motionless body on the floor. He saw at once that she was dead. The two shaken survivors sat huddled together in the darkness, waiting for the morning light to come. At dawn, Rice set out to find help. Tovilia was too hysterical to make the effort. Despite his injured foot, Rice managed to limp to the home of their nearest neighbor, which was over a mile away. This neighbor drove him into town so they could summon police. Investigators found that Mummy had been shot once through the chest. In one of the walls, they found embedded a handmade bullet of the sort that was common in the area. Although the victim had led a quiet, reclusive life, it soon emerged that there was no shortage of people who might have wished her dead. Mummy was a quarrelsome sort who had feuded with most of her neighbors, something that only exacerbated her sinister occult reputation. She was believed to have turned an evil eye on one of her enemies and hexed several others. A great sigh of relief went out over Ringwood when it was learned she was dead. In short, the police were confronted with a plethora of possible suspects. Soon, however, their focus was centered on one man. Three days after the murder, some local boys told the detective in charge of the case that on the night Mummy was shot, they had seen a car parked on the road leading to the victim's home. No one was in the car, but they immediately recognized it as belonging to a 23-year-old named Albert Shinsky. Shinsky was a polite, well-behaved, good-natured young man with an exemplary reputation. Everyone who knew him liked him. His family was equally well-respected in the community, and he was fortunate enough to be engaged to Selena Bernstell, a pretty, charming girl who adored him. It would be hard to think of anyone less likely to assassinate a defenseless old woman. Shinsky's life was happy and uneventful until he reached the age of 17. Then he gradually changed. The once energetic boy became increasingly lethargic. He lost the energy to work or do much of anything else. He became thin and haggard-looking. The young man became a shell of his former self and no one could explain why. Unable to hold down any job requiring physical or mental exertion, Shinsky earned a meager living as a taxi driver for the local mine workers. When questioned by the police, Shinsky acknowledged being near the mummy house at the time of the murder. When asked why he was there, he calmly gave a startling reply. I went out there to kill Mrs. Mummy. Things only got weirder from there. Without the slightest hesitation, Shinsky treated the detectives to the strangest motive for murder any of them had ever heard. The young man explained that when he was 17, he'd been working for a farmer who had gotten into a long, extremely bitter fight with Mrs. Mummy over property boundaries between their respective lands. One day, as Shinsky was walking through the disputed land, he saw Mrs. Mummy standing a short distance away, staring at him. Under her hostile gaze, the youth broke out in a cold sweat. He felt like there were hands gripping his throat. From that day on, he said, he felt a constant physical and mental torment that sapped him of all his strength. Susan Mummy had put a hex on him. Shinsky emotionally described how he constantly felt invisible hands on his shoulders. Pins were stuck into him. A black cat would come down from the sky and attack him while he slept. He tried going to doctors and priests, but they were of no help. What could they or anyone else do against the power of the devil? In desperation, he consulted some local witch doctors who gave him various amulets and spells, but they provided only temporary relief. The cat always came back. Finally, a spirit came to him, explaining that the only way he could be free of the hex was if he killed Susan Mummy. So, on the night of March 17th, he borrowed a shotgun, loaded it with a magic bullet guaranteed to kill witches, and made his way to the mummy farm. Shinsky did not enjoy committing murder, but he cheerfully explained it worked. Since mummy's death, he was a reborn man. He had no regrets whatsoever for what he had done. 
Indeed, he radiated a joy and relief that these hardened investigators found uniquely disturbing. Selena Bernstell confirmed much of Shinsky's story. She had no doubt that he had been bewitched, saying, my cousin used to be visited by the ghost of an old woman who cast a spell over her. Her affection for him had a strongly maternal quality. Selena both loved and pitied this haunted young man who would tell her that she was the only friend he had. She described him as a little puppy dog and a lost soul. The hex, she quietly told the police, had begun to affect her as well. She would periodically wake up in the morning to see a vision of Shinsky standing at the foot of her bed, his face grimacing in pain. Every time this happened, she'd find out that he'd been visited by the evil cat or the spirit figure of Susan Mummy herself, leering and leering at him. Selena said that Shinsky had repeatedly begged Mummy to lift the hex from him, but she refused. Selena often asked Shinsky to marry her, but he refused, saying the witch wouldn't let him. Although Selena had not known he had committed murder, she admitted that she knew something had happened because Albert seemed different and more upbeat. He acted as if something had been taken off of him. She was too happy with his transformation to ask any questions. After his arrest, Shinsky became something of a local hero. Other men went to the police alleging that Susan Mummy had cast spells on them as well, hexes that were only broken with her death townsfolk raised a defense fund for him. The murderer himself remained happy and unconcerned. Even the thought of facing the electric chair didn't faze him. I don't care, he said. I'm at peace. Selena expressed her willingness to marry him while he still sat in his prison cell, but Shinsky refused any thought of such a dismal wedding. He told reporters he expected to be released soon, after which he looked forward to marrying my girl. The court hardly knew what to make of this young man. The story he told was deeply, utterly crazy, but aside from that, Shinsky appeared calm and rational. He indignantly rejected any suggestion of any insanity defense. Psychiatrists who interviewed him thought otherwise. They came up with a diagnosis of dementia precox, manifesting itself as paranoid delusions, and recommended that he be sent to Fairview State Hospital for the criminally insane. The judge in the case agreed. Unfortunately for Shinsky, Fairview could give witches and demon cats a run for their money. It had an evil reputation that, sadly, was entirely justified. It was an unsupervised hellhole where even basic medical care was virtually non-existent. Guards and staff routinely abused the patients, sometimes to the point of killing them. There were sinister rumors of secret graveyards around the building, it was not a hospital but an unregulated dumping ground, and would remain so well into the 1970s. If you were not insane when you entered Fairview, odds were good that you soon would be. Shinsky disappeared into this living nightmare, never, it seemed, to be heard from again. The world forgot about him until 1968, when a lawyer named William J. Krenskowicz learned of the case which inspired him to lead an effort to have Shinsky re-examined by psychiatrists. Shinsky himself was eager to have his case reopened, even if it meant standing trial for the murder if he was judged to be sane. I was a stupid, foolish, superstitious young man when I did the murder, but I do think I've been punished enough. The issue of what to do with Shinsky dragged through the courts until January 1976 when a judge ruled that he was competent to stand trial. However, the authorities apparently agreed that Shinsky was indeed punished enough, as I could not find any record that his trial ever took place. Shinsky may very well have been released without ever being tried for a murder no one doubted he committed. He went back to Ringtown, where he lived quietly until his death in 1983. When Weird Darkness returns, it's called a freak of nature, as weird as it is beautiful. Seen here are terrifying flying entities, giant skeletons, and even the legendary Bigfoot. 
we'll look at the mysterious, strange, and dangerous Ophikonoki Swamp in Georgia. Central Massachusetts is a land of oddities and apparitions. Stories of the strange and paranormal have been passed down from generation to generation, and only the local populace has any idea of just how vast and deep their superstitions run. The world around you is much more than you can touch, taste, smell, see, and hear. Some of the stories are funny, some are sad, but all of them give you a taste of what it's like to be from the oddest part of the United States. You can't have a region of the country that has been settled for centuries without getting a few odd tales out of it. Open up a whole new world of fact and fiction that will leave you with a deep appreciation for the strange and bizarre. Ghosts and heroes await, and the only thing they need to live on is you. Slightly Odd Fitchburg by Ed Sweeney now available on Kindle, paperback, and audiobook versions on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. often called a freak of nature, Okafenoki is as strange as it is beautiful. Many years ago, one scientist interested in Okafenoki said there is nothing else like it in the world, and that's a correct assumption because it's a unique place. The Okafenoki Swamp covers nearly 700 square miles, almost all of which is in Georgia, and this wonderland is a significant part of North America's heritage. A visit to Okafenoki Swamp gives the impression you made a journey back in time to those days when dinosaurs ruled the world. If you decide to visit the Okafenoki Swamp, be careful because dangerous animals are lurking behind the bushes. You can encounter poisonous snakes and alligators. The Okafenoki Swamp is also home to magnificent and rare bird species, as well as several unique species of carnivorous plants. Admirers of nature will find Okafenoki Swamp a great place to visit, but this place is also interesting to those who are fascinated with ancient history, myths, legends, and unexplained phenomena. Seminole Indians knew this place long before white men rediscovered it. The Okafenoki Swamp is a land of rich folklore, medicinal plants, magic, and some strange events. Many Native American legends tell Okafenoki was once inhabited by different mysterious beings we cannot identify. Who were the flying creatures Indians feared so much? Someone once wrote, The warlike Indians of the Crees and Seminoles have a religious veneration for this immense place. They say it's inhabited by aerial beings. They have a number of legends connected with its history, but the center is composed of high land, on which are erected their wigwams. Many after that, they have seen those aerial beings on the confines of their enchanted habitations. Not even one of their warriors would venture among the gloom of its shade after sunset for the best American scalp. When early geographers explored the place, they described the Okafenoki Swamp as a terrifying bog. Explorers reported hearing spooky noises and wondered what dangerous creatures could be hiding in the marsh. Later, they realized the sounds were caused by dead trees scraping against each other when the wind blew. Not everything that happens in the vicinity of the Okafenoki Swamp can be explained by modern science. People have witnessed puzzling, unidentified lights that cannot be tracked to any known object, craft, or place. Native Americans tell the Okafenoki Swamp was and still is home to an immortal race, in ancient times, the Spaniard and Indians encountered these mysterious beings in battles, but they could never defeat the immortals. In North American folklore, Bigfoot is described as a hairy, upright, walking, ape-like creature that dwells in the wilderness. According to the Milledgeville, Georgia newspaper in 1829, two men and a young boy decided to visit the Okafenoki Swamp because they had heard legends about a race of giants who lived in the swamp. They journeyed into the deep interior of the swamp 
where they discovered giant tracks. Later, when they returned home, they told locals what they had found, and a group of hunters went to the place to investigate. There they encountered a giant beast that decapitated five of the hunters. After a hard struggle, it was killed by the surviving men of the hunting expedition. Another intriguing story emerged in more recent years. Jim Miles, in his book Weird Georgia, reports that in 1969, Tom Chesser told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution Sunday Magazine that in the 1920s he unearthed 13 skeletons for a university professor who had hired him to excavate the mounds. According to Chesser, some of the skeletons were crossed, one on top of the other, some were face down, all of them were perfect when they were first discovered. Teeth even still had some glaze on them, but when air struck, it crumbled them. They were giants. Those jawbones would go over my whole face, Chesser said. Many captivating and unexplained modern sightings of elusive creatures and puzzling lights are still reported. These stories are, of course, fascinating, but without proper investigations, it's difficult to determine why people had strange encounters and sightings while visiting Okefenokee Swamp. It's fair to say that the Okefenokee Swamp remains, until this day, shrouded in a veil of mystery, charm, and fear. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share a link to this episode and recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share a link to the podcast, it helps spread the word about it, growing our weirdo family, and also helps get the word out about resources available for those who suffer from depression. So please share the podcast with others. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Hauntings of Eastern State Mental Asylum is by Inigo Gonzalez for Ranker. Cool Hand on My Shoulder is from Weirdo Family member Krista Lee. The Witch of Ringtown was posted at Strange Company. When Killers Capture Themselves was written by Abby White for the lineup. And Bigfoot, Giant Skeletons, and Okefenokee Swamp is by Ellen Lloyd for Ancient Pages. Weird Darkness Theme by Alibi Music. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark, and now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Luke chapter 6, verse 35a. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And a final thought, God doesn't give you the people you want. He gives you the people you need. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness. The Kansas serial killer, whose modus operandi was bind, strangle, kill, or BSK, entered bind, strangle, kill, no, no, it's bind, it's bind, torture, kill. After years of going uncaught following the murder of 10 Kansas locals, including four out of five members of the years, including four out of five members of the Otero family, the Kansas serial killer, whose modus operandi, the serial, ugh, for crying, <laughs> these are not difficult words, Darren. Thank you.